Let's get busy. Mark Murphy in the house. What's up, my brother? How you doing? <laughs> I'm good. It's good to be here. Uh, well, I appreciate you coming out. I'm a huge fan um, of Mark Murphy, the person. <laughs> but then when I get to, I find out, you know, you're a lawyer by day, you're Superman by day, or Clark Kent. How are you? You <laughs> you got this alter ego. I no, it's not really alter. I don't. But the cartoon thing, the editorial thing, is how I gravitated to you. Sure. And we're going to talk about that. You mean you haven't been following my my cases in court? I need to start <laughs> because I'm sure I can probably learn something from it. No, not really. Um, Louisville all your life? Where are you from? No, no. Originally from eastern Kentucky. Okay. Northeastern Kentucky. North, Ashland. Ashland. Okay. And um, went to, um, got an army scholarship and went to Notre Dame for college. Yeah. And uh, came back to Kentucky because I was pretty sure I was going to run for political office. Um, really? And I needed to be back in Kentucky. And the University of Louisville is a good law school. And Louisville is a great town. Mm -hmm. And so came back to Louisville kind of law school. Then owed the army four years as a result of them paying for college yeah. and had a I was really blessed to be able to serve great tours of duty in, in very um, interesting and challenging places um, in Germany and Central America and then after that came back to Louisville and there's never any doubt that I was going to come back to Louisville yeah. so Germany Central America wow yeah so um, we were just watching my youngest son and I were just watching the Chernobyl HBO series I've heard and, about that. And, I want to watch it. I it's it. Uh, it's it's great and troubling. And um, at one point, my son because it's at, factual. Well, because it's factual <laughs> and terrifying. And at one point, my son caught me looking at my phone and, do, and doing some rudimentary um, uh, math, sure. mathematics on my phone because I'm not a numbers guy. Right. I couldn't do it in my head. And sure enough, I was. <laughs> He thought it was kind of funny. Then he started to wonder if this didn't explain a lot of things. But it ends up that I was in Germany when Chernobyl uh, occurred. Oh, oh really? Okay. And they were sending, according to the movie and history, they were sending the Germans were sending their school children inside um, when that happened because of the cloud that was uh, forming over Europe. And I have no memory of being sent inside. <laughs> Well, the, well, that that explains why you have a tail. You're, you yeah. have a, <laughs> yeah, you can't see that on this. He can. No. Yeah. He's got a, another head protruding out of his back. Yeah. Um, that's kind of interesting. Yeah, no, it, uh, that was interesting. The tour was great. It was Cold War. So, yeah. again, something that makes me seem a thousand years old to my uh, sons and most of the people that I run into, even in the elevator at the law firm at this point in time. Um, and then, um, so that was the Cold War, and uh, the Iron Curtain was up, and there were a limited number of countries east, of course, that you could visit, only under special circumstances. Right. And then I was in Central America, and um, I was lucky enough, privileged enough to serve as the, uh, the JAG officer for the 3rd of the 7th Special Forces. I was not Special Forces, but I took care of these guys, their legal needs and things like that, and mm. traveled um, around Central America for them, and that was also between uh, 1987 and 80, 86 and 88, mm -hmm. um, interesting times in Central America. We were fighting the war, not war in El Salvador. Right. And um, uh, we had Green Braves, as you can imagine, who were killed down there. That's and right. Then yeah. in, uh, yeah. But they weren't killed in combat because Congress never said we were in combat. So well, those were, What's the official? Do you, is there an official? I, I'm sure there is. What, how did they meet their demise? Officially, officially, uh, they were uh, everything from training accidents to actually, of course, they were killed in combat. But, mm -hmm. um, things were more things were complicated for the families because of the rules of engagement. Yeah. Back then, there seemed to be rules of engagement, uh, and one of the, my duties as a as a jag lawyer was to teach the law of war. It sounds silly when you say it sometimes, but I taught the law of war to soldiers mm -hmm. and commanders. And um, in a nutshell, what is that? I mean, well, Geneva Convention, mm -hmm. rules of engagement, yeah. uh, you don't shoot at civilians, you right. don't bomb hospitals, um, uh, things like that. Uh, so but that also, was the law of war then? Is, it, is that still kind of the, the law now? Or is that, well, that's where I was going. I'm okay. not sure that it is uh, anymore. Okay. Yeah. Um, and, you know, there, there used to be a pretty, pretty thick line 
uh, in terms of whether we were at war or not. Who could declare war? And we just had this discussion about a, two or three weeks ago with whether or not Donald Trump was going to send troops to Iraq, more troops to Iraq. And, um, um, and basically bypassing Congress, too, right? Bypassing Congress. Yeah. Every president's done it. Yeah. Um, so it's a, it's a mess, messy, messy thing now, and the lines mm-hmm. aren't as clear. Um, it's funny, the other day, I, who was it, Eisenhower? When he, was it Eisenhower left office? Eisenhower, one of them, when they left office, ending their presidency, uh, they made that infamous speech about... The military-industrial mil- complex. Yes. It was Eisenhower, yeah. Eisenhower. Yeah. And... Um, he was right. He was right. He was right about a lot of things. Yeah. He was right about the role of religion in politics. Mm-hmm. Um, and here we are. <laughs> He's my kind of guy. Um, so you you come back to Louisville, or you come to Louisville, I guess, at that point, right? You're, no, that would have been a return, because I was okay. here in law school. So oh, I was here in three okay. years. Oh, fell, that's right. You had to go. Fell in love your, with Louisville. Yeah, um, your, yeah. uh, and um, that was upon my return, yeah. So four years later. So I arrived in Louisville then in 1989, end of 1989, 1990. Mm-hmm. I, I mean, nineteen, yeah, nineteen eighty nine, nineteen ninety, exactly. Yeah, and is that when you start your law, getting in law? Or? Yeah, well, um, I, I practiced law in the army. That's what I did. Right, so yeah. I did court martials and the whole law of war thing and all mm-hmm. of that, um, which was great training, because unlike more or less being thrown to the wolves when you start in private practice um, stateside, in the army, like so many other things, it's all about the training, yeah. and. Um, there's been a lot of things said about military courts martial and things like that, but uh, the judges were, they all outranked you. The judges had all of themselves been trial lawyers, not something you always have in state or federal court. Um, the judges knew what you had gone through. <coughs> the jury sometimes outranked you uh, in a court martial, yeah. Really? Yeah. And so um, they become impatient and they let you know that they were impatient. Mm-hmm. I, I, had a, I had a juror, this makes. Um, my friends who are trial lawyers now laugh, but I've, I had a juror in a, in a trial in a court martial one time uh, shout out, move along, Captain Murphy, because <laughs> I'd been taking too long on the questioning. Not something you put up with usually in civilian juries. Yeah. But so that was great training. Mm-hmm. And plus we were overseas. So um, there was a whole lot of camaraderie. The defense counsel and the prosecutors all got together. After every trial, the judge would take you out for um, dinner or a beer and say so. Lieutenant Jones, you never should have called that witness. Uh, Captain Murphy, you should have let him call that witness. Why did you object? You know, don't mm. object when the other side's killing their case. Oh, wow. And so you'd have these ongoing, continuing legal education seminars. And that was okay? Oh, it was totally okay. okay. After the case was over with. After, after the case. Yeah, okay. after the case was right. over what with. I was yeah, like, yeah, you yeah. said after like... Did, or, no, after every yeah. day. No, yeah. that would be yeah. interesting. No, after every, uh, <coughs> after every trial, the, the judge would take the time, and, you know... You're also overseas, mm-hmm. maybe or maybe without your family, and um, there wasn't uh, something else to do or someplace other elsewhere to go. We were mostly single, young captains trying cases mm-hmm. alone. Um, the single jurors, captains in another country in uniform. Yeah, that that probably. We had more money than we'd ever had in our lives. <laughs> He's uh, smiling. We, Fra- <laughs> Paris was four and a half hours away by by car. <coughs> So we didn't do a lot of work. Pre-married days. Right? Pre-married days. Yeah. yeah. Every once in a while, a new guy would show up, and he, he's still he or she, smiling. <laughs> what we're going to do now is talk about sports. Yeah, we're going to yeah, segue. <laughs> segue. Now, those well, are good times. Did you ever, um, if you did, how did you react? And if you didn't, how would you have reacted to the infamous, you can't handle the truth during a trial? With your peers. Yeah, never had to do that myself. Um, But a lot of that movie, like when Kevin Bacon and Tom Cruise are sharing a beer and talking about the case, Mm -hmm. that's what happens. That does it. Um, And that doesn't happen, as you can imagine, very much in the civilian world. Um, It probably should. There'd be a lot more things worked out. You'd fight about the things that are important and Mm -hmm. worth fighting over. Um, That moment in that fake trial though it's one of the best moments yeah, in movie history is. for sure I've used yeah. that I've uh, taught at uh, a couple of colleges and, and at L's law school trial practice 
and um, I'm not ashamed to show that clip at all. Oh, it's, yeah. I mean, yeah, it's uh, that's one of those iconic moments in uh, in film. So, um, you're back here, you're in, you're starting to practice. What, what type of uh, law are you practicing? Well, I, because I began as a prosecutor, okay. um, and actually I began as defense counsel uh, when I was in Louisville. You're clearly significantly younger than me, but there was a lawyer in Louisville uh, yeah. named Frank Haddad. I'm, I and, know the name. Um, he, there's now the, all the, the Haddads. All the Haddads. <laughs> Frank and Bobby Haddad. Yeah. So they ran a defense firm, and I was lucky enough to get a clerking position with Frank Haddad. So I, I was his law clerk for three years, and. Um, Oh, it was a fabulous situation uh, to just listen and learn. Absolutely. I didn't. I provided no value to him, mm. um, and it was interesting. It's the kind of thing that doesn't happen in large law firms anymore, and it probably can't happen at a public defender's office or a prosecutor's office anymore because mm. there's just not enough time. But mm. I'd get a, 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 a call on my intercom, and Frank would say, "Mark, I need you to come to my office." And I'd go to his office, and he'd just he'd be on the phone already, or he'd be talking to a client. Um, who could be a judge, who could be a police officer, who could be a person charged with five murders. Mm-hmm. I mean, he represented everybody right. excellently. And he'd just point to the chair and he'd just say, sit down. And three hours later, I'd still have no assignment, have nothing to do, and he just would, I'd try to get up, he'd say, sit down, sit down, sit down. While he was still like, While he was still there. And I learned later from lawyers in the office who had been clerks for him mm-hmm. that uh, he liked, first of all, he liked to have people watch him work mm-hmm. it, it made things more uh, uh, I guess tolerable in the, in the, in the, in the boring times mm-hmm. but also he just wanted me to see yeah. so I spent really three years going to law school but really going to law school with Frank okay. Haddad yeah. um, so when I came back I practiced criminal law job training yeah. Yeah, it was mm-hmm. great yeah. and yeah, so now I'm in a big firm mm-hmm. and um, <clears throat> I uh, conduct the firms um, with, with one other great lawyer conduct the firm's um, criminal practice um, and really love what I do. Good. And you've been doing that for 10 years? <laughs> 11? Well, let's see. Uh, something like that. Yeah, Younger. probably 30-something at this really? point. Really? Yeah. When, yeah. What, when, when you, you went to high school in Ashley? Yeah, so I graduated. I mean, it's easy to calculate. So I, yeah. I, I graduated high school in 1977. Okay. Yeah. You got me about eight. Eight. See, I mean, you're, that's not 85. even close. I mean, it's close. Dude, enough. I was in the third grade when you were born. I mean, that's don't don't even try to con, okay. try to compare. All right, but you look good. You look good. All right, <laughs> on so, radio. Oh, he's got her down. <laughs> Y'all don't know we're on video. Oh, okay. Keep in mind, we're on video. He says sure. I look good. He says I look yeah, he good. He does. He does look good. Um, at what point do you uh, get involved with media? Oh, are you ready to go there? Or, 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 yeah. Or, no. Okay. Um, just hadn't heard the question asked that way before. Um, I mean, am I wrong? Is I, that no, not the right way to? No, it's, it's perfectly okay. asked. I, um, we talked about this a little bit before. I, uh, I grew up in a, what you would call a media family. Mm-hmm. Um, my dad was, uh, he was a World War II veteran, and he came to um, radio through a failed acting career um, as Presumably, 99% of acting careers are failed acting careers. Right. And, um, he ended up in Ashland uh, running a radio station. And it was a small radio station, so all of us in the family, I was doing radio commercials from the time I was six. I was doing radio com- I have a sister who's two years younger than me. And I was doing radio commercials where we were so young that I was reading my lines while my dad was whispering my sister's so she lines been to her. first grade when I was born, right? There you go. Okay. <laughs> uh, so I was, I mean, I've always been kind of comfortable in that role and my dad was a very public figure uh, in that region and a very political figure in that region never ran for or held public office but he um, pretty always, important I don't know about well, important, important but he was but always involved somewhat of a celebrity probably he was relied upon um, in the community to be the guy who uh, would never say no. Mm-hmm. He, of course, he had he had the radio station, so he brought that with him, mm-hmm. and um, he would MC your beauty pageant, and he would MC your parade, and he okay. would uh, give a speech to the American Legion, and he would do all of those things. So it was it was a it was a different childhood, different yeah. house to grow up in, because all of my friends' dads would come home or not come home, but they'd be there roughly at five thirty or six and yeah. have dinner, and then read the paper and maybe watch TV. And kids would say, "Where's your dad?" And I would Still say, doing stuff. "He's well." And we, this is how we talked to my family. I said, well, he's out speaking. Mm-hmm. And 
I, I, it, it was a couple of years before I realized that made no sense to people. Like, mm-hmm. why is he speaking? Who's he speaking? My dad speaks. Right. You yeah. know, it, <laughs> your dad's speaking. I don't understand that. Um, came to um, but he's Louis- getting paid to speak there's a big difference yeah, he, yeah exactly <laughs> my dad's getting paid well actually no I don't think he ever got paid either I, you could have uh, played, played along but he was the, he was the community guy he was he was very well right uh, for sure um, speaking though stuff like it he might have got paid directly but perks and I mean that's just how it works <laughs> you know anybody like that um, Not also, that that's what he was soliciting, but, you know, it just... No, and I'm sure that he loved... He did. He loved the attention. Yeah. I don't think somebody that's a, that's comes back from the to, war yeah. and decides to go into acting right. if they hate attention. That's they don't decide to go into TV and right. host a dance party. Yeah. They're very they comfortable don't. with themselves. Confident. Right. Yeah. Right. But like a lot of people, I mean, uh, the, you know, there, there are two sides to that, too. So that person then has to escape and has right. to get away. Um, and and when, uh, because your escape at that point, your escape and your getaways are a lot more limited than yeah. Than well, they're the also person. well. What happens is your escape is being with your family. That, there you go. And maybe yeah. you're not getting the best that's, that's, of that I person. Gotcha. Yeah. You know, and yeah. I, and I know that my mom struggled with this, and and um, uh, you know, every family has their own dynamics. Mm-hmm. Came to um, Louisville and then practiced law. Uh, pursued the goal of running for office. And um, eventually was appointed by started As a well started to uh, run for both state representative and state senator. Okay, and those campaigns were artificially halted because the people against whom I would have been running or who I would have been running in place of I was a registered Democrat at the Thank time uh, decided to keep their seats. Uh. Um, I put together campaigns because they had both. I guess they figured I was going to be so awful that even though they really wanted to retire and leave office, they stayed in office just so I wouldn't have their, have their jobs. Um, ultimately, though, I used all of those were they connections. Right? What's that? Were they right? I don't think they were okay. right. Just I would have been right. I, mean, yeah. I could have been a contender. <laughs> I got it. So um, I eventually was appointed by the governor to be Commonwealth's attorney mm-hmm. here in Louisville, which was perfect because um, that's, the, that's the chief prosecutor. Right, yeah. And that's what I'd been doing is defending, and I'd been a prosecutor in the Army. And um, that was a great, great position. The people in the office were fabulous. I had 35 prosecutors that I worked with. Right. Um, and, I mean, I was technically their boss, but they were I wasn't the boss of any of them. They were doing their jobs, and they were professionals. Um, and But I had to run to keep the office as an appointee oh, I see, yeah. and was defeated um, because I was not the better candidate. At the time, I guess this was 1996. Went back into private practice, and still had the um, inclination and the bug, and uh, wanted to be involved in the politics of the community, mm-hmm. the state, the nation. Somehow, um, right about that time, the Courier. Where did you grow up? Here. You grew up here, oh. so you remember Hugh Haney. Mm-hmm. And his his role with the his legendary role with the Courier Journal. Yeah, yeah. I mean, he was he was the best. And he retired, and they replaced him with Nick Anderson, mm. also the best. Um, ended up winning a Pulitzer Prize here in Louisville for the Courier Journal I know that. for his cartoons. Well, yeah, well, I mean he's just there. You go. I mean great. You, you win that that proves you're one um, of the best. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. And um, then. Uh, this, I don't remember the timing exactly, and I'm not a historian in that regard, but the, the Bingham sold the paper right. at some point in time, right then or around then. Mid-2000? Early? 2000? Yeah, I think it was, see, I feel like it was before that, so okay. maybe, maybe the timing's the off. You really? But nonetheless, okay. Nick uh-huh. Anderson wasn't working for the Binghams, gotcha. and he left to uh, draw for the Houston Chronicle. So bigger market, oh, bigger, yeah. bigger platform, yeah. you know. Um, and then for about six or seven years, uh, I'd, I'd get the paper every morning, open the paper, no cartoons, no Louisville cartoons, no Kentucky cartoons, nobody drawing here in Louisville. Um, so they were probably pulling them off the yeah, wire. Yeah. And that's fine. Okay. But um, for six, seven years? So no. A long time. No local. Cartoonist the, the the owners of the the new owners of the Courier Journal were not going to hire a full time cartoonist, and that put them in the great majority of all newspapers in the nation. Right now, this will this will surprise you, I think. 
when you think about how many newspapers there are in the nation, mm-hmm. you know, you just count up the large cities, count up the states, multiply by four or five at least, you know, in, least, in the yeah. states. Putting aside even the truly small town papers, mm-hmm. today in 2019, there are, I think, 32 full time cartoonists. Only 32 in the entire nation. Wow. Another Pulitzer Prize winner is fired every week. I'm a member of an organ, a couple of organizations that. that uh, fired because of their content? Uh, possibly yes. Okay. In the in the in the Trump era, they've been fired because of their content. Well, I have heard some. Before yeah. that, they were already getting fired because um, you 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 don't make. There's no advertising dollars. There's no money to be made off of political cartoons. Mm-hmm. You can't sell space uh, in on a page in which you've got a picture of Donald Trump on the toilet. Not that. I, and I have never. I don't use bathroom humor, and I don't know that anybody's ever done that. But the point is, you, you know, Hertz Rent a Car isn't going to pay you for an ad on that page, or in that spot. So uh, I'm th- surprised because to me, what you do, what the, all of you guys do, done, gets a reaction. It I really mean, does. Well, and it gets. It's, and I, it, it's all visual. Well, and we were talking about monetization. Yeah. And how the fact I, I shouldn't tell your audience this, but you've just signed this million dollar contract that you were telling me about oh, beforehand. Yeah. And congratulations. Nice. And um, you need somebody. I do. Same thing. It is. What yes. Is we can say that on the air. That's yes. a double, yes. and it's an old Forester, and I'm not yes. getting paid to say that. Thank you. <laughs> um, I, you know, I didn't realize until uh, I was coming back from South Louisville. Coming down Seventh Street. Speaking of that South Louisville, we'll continue, but I'm gonna bring that up. So okay. I'm glad you just brought that up. Um, and you know, there's always been a bottle on top of the Brown Foreman Distilleries. Oh yeah, yeah. large bottle. And from my law offices, uh, I can show guests, out of town guests, the silhouette of a bottle that are, that's you know 20 blocks away. Right. That's an Old Forester Blue Label 86 bottle that, no that's shit. on top of that. Yes, and and I don't know when this has happened, and your your your. Brown Foreman listeners will correct this uh, or, or actually add to this, um, but they've taken the trouble to repaint, refurbish. Because I know that it was an older. Thank you so much. Nice. That's very nice. Thank you. I've, I've, you'll get my card. <laughs> um, it's an old Forester '86 bottle, which is my. I love that because to me it's Louisville's bourbon. It's it up is, there on top yeah. of the building. I digress. Um, the newspapers will tell you that. Uh, when they add up their clicks, views, mm-hmm. this is what you're doing, it's what everybody right. in modern media is doing, mm-hmm. that aside from the day's biggest sports story, if it's a significant sports story, mm-hmm. um, the editorial page gets the most attention. And we know this anecdotally. Your dad came home, opened up the sports, went to the editorial page mm-hmm. to either be angry or mad or to be uh, outraged or whatever. Right. And I agree. And everyone knows this. But the more, the bigger and bigger the media <coughs> conglomerates become, the less likely they are to want to take the risk that one of their advertisers or the people that give them their money is going to be offended by a cartoon. Mm-hmm. And and cartoons more so than editorial content. No no paper that I know of has been told to stop writing editorials, right? All right. But here's why. If there's uh, let's say that there's a battle in Afghanistan, and my son just returned from Afghanistan, so I'm very mm-hmm. sensitive to these sorts of issues. If the editorial writer writes five paragraphs about American blood being spilled in Afghanistan you read it everybody reads it you get angry or sad or mm-hmm. patriotic or whatever mm-hmm. you have an emotion but it's a intellectual emotion because right. processing reading is an intellectual act yeah. um, the way our brains develop somebody told me this one time after a lecture uh, so that we could not be eaten by saber tooth tigers and so that we didn't eat you know a poisonous bug we learn to see things before we learn to read things obviously that's mm-hmm. an obvious thing well, so as a result, right next to the 1,500-word essay about the blood of American soldiers, if I have a cartoon that shows an American soldier lying in his own blood, you know, I'll get death threats. And all I've done is portray the same thing that the people you, on the you, left-hand side of the page yeah. have written. You put to art what you've just in, 
interpret it, but yeah. The word. So uh, I think that's one of the reasons. Um, I also think lack of courage, yeah. and I also think uh, you know, big business is big business. But that's why there are so few now full-time guys and women. Some of the best cartoonists are women um, doing this job. So it had been six or seven years. And there hadn't been a cartoonist in Louisville. And there was a time, and, and this was breaking my heart. Um, having, it, it was breaking my heart with no intentions. I had no plans. But there was a time when president that we like to call Richard Nixon. Uh, there's a famous picture of Harry Truman reading the Louisville Courier Journal. You may have seen that. It's a great photo. Because we were talking about Truman before. It's a great picture of Harry Truman reading the Courier. Yeah, I know. Um, like from... The Oval Office, or yeah, yeah, really? Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> I have to um, Google that. Too. Yeah, no, I mean, you could type yeah, in Harry, yeah, Harry Truman okay. Courier Journal, you'd yeah, see that. Picture. Okay. Richard Nixon uh, said famously that he read five papers every morning. This is before you could, you know, look at your feed. Yeah. And so his feed was somebody brought him in five newspapers. It was New York Times, Washington Post, L.A. Times, Miami Herald to get the the you know the new Florida. Right. Now that they have air conditioning, right? <laughs> uh, and people are moving there. And the Louisville Courier Journal. Okay. Those were the five papers he read. Not the Kansas City paper, not the Des Moines Register, not yeah. the, because the, the Courier Journal and the Binghams and the, the, the journalism that went on there, um, he considered to be representative of, excuse me, of this part of the, um, of the country. So anyway, so here's... We had that much yes. status? Yes. I mean, really? you, you talk to... Um, I'm... I'm uh, I have a person who I consider a friend. She probably thinks I'm a hanger-on, but there, there's a Bingham who likes me. <laughs> and and uh, I, I, I always say, you guys, buy the paper. you got to buy the paperback. Please buy the paperback. Um, so I thought, after all this time, the paper of Hugh Haney, the paper of Nick Anderson, the state's most important newspaper, with all due respect to the Lexington Herald Leader. This is Louisville, yes, Kentucky. I'm very I'm an Eastern Kentuckian who says yeah, that. Right. Um, no political cartoons. So um, I did. I had drawn my whole life. Um, oh yeah. Okay. I, I, I mentioned before that I can't count or do science, even though I'm fascinated by both of them. So I did posters and things in school okay. to do that. I tried to make that happen at Notre Dame. That didn't work. So I just had to take bad classes. Um, but I always drew and doodled, and I was that dude. Mm -hmm. um, so I started practicing. Uh, was, was quite confident about what my wife's reaction would be to this. So I didn't tell her. So you're married at this time. Yes. Okay. And still I am, despite the fact that I did this. <laughs> And uh, finally drew a cartoon, uh, tried to develop a style, which now, 12 years later, is not the style I have now, and that's what's going to happen. Um, took it down to the Courier and left it there and left a note. Uh, the editors at the Courier knew who I was because I'd been the prosecuting attorney mm -hmm. and uh, just kind of kept my fingers crossed. And they called and they said they liked it and they wanted me to do more. And now it's 12 years later. and. Fortunately, there's iPads, and yeah. uh, I can send things electronically, and right. I don't have to drive them down to the right. newspaper every day. And so you've been doing it that long? Yeah. Or 12? Yeah. Really? Yeah. I didn't know that. Okay. I did it before. I mean, I mean one, of the, one of the most fun nights I've had was the night of Barack Obama's first election, mm -hmm. being down at the Courier, um, drawing. Well, so you, you, you just uh, beat me to uh, one of my oh. next questions, which is fine. I'll just segue to it, uh, of, of the... Of your work, cartoon work, what, what has been some of your high points? Oh. The, your better. All right, let me. I'm a, let me make sure I rephrase. Of of things that's happened, uh, milestones in our country mm. that you've been able to jump on and support. Oh, interesting. What what would be you, Obama's 2008 the election the win would it, would that yeah. some of your highlights? Yeah. Okay. That that, I have a memory of that because I I, I normally don't draw at the Courier, because um, that's now we're, that's eleven years. So you, that would have been early for you, right? Yeah, that Close was right at the beginning. beginning. Yeah, I just I'd been I'd been drawing long enough that I wasn't awful. So that's good. You were staying I, between the lines. I was ready. Yeah, I was coloring between the lines. <laughs> I was I was ready for President Obama to be elected. Um, you know, that's an early, really big moment. Yeah. Um, that's a great question. I can't, um, 
Well, thinking about politics alone. Alone. Um, yeah. First. Um, well, you don't, have, you don't have to stay there. I mean, Yeah, no, but anything. it's... You, it's kind of the easy way to organize the thoughts, I guess. The um, well, I tell you, I've, I was hesitant to tell people this uh, because there's a lot of suspicious people in the world. But I had on the night of fast forwarding eight years, on the night of Donald Trump's election, I had drawn um, just two hands passing a baton, and the one hand with the, with with what was obviously his cufflink. Uh, mm -hmm. A black hand was Barack Obama's hand uh, passing the baton. Mm -hmm. And the hand grasping the baton was in a light blue pantsuit. Mm -hmm. Although you, you had to guess that it was a pantsuit. <laughs> All you could see was the sleeve. But it was definitely going to be a pantsuit yeah. um, with some frill. And it was obviously Hillary's hand reaching out for the, um, for the baton. And I'd drawn that. And uh, I remember you asked about moments. I remember the moment that night. When I stopped drawing that, I can I can literally I can tell you where I was sitting and where I was what my wife looked like. Just some spoiler alert: a ghost. Yeah. Um, uh, when I stopped drawing that cartoon, no, it wasn't a premonition. Mm -hmm. It's when the network started to say, "Uh oh." Uh oh. Yeah. And um, I, so I, I recall that. Stay with that thought. <laughs> you, know, you know, when when it came to the that whole um, that whole election. I never, I never said Trump's going to win. I always said to myself, Hillary's going to lose this. Yeah. She's going to lose this. Yeah. And that's kind of what she did. I mean, unless you buy into the collusion and all that stuff, theory. But well, it's. I think that ultimately, I hear why you're saying that. I think that ultimately, truthfully, we're going to find out that in I mean, she fact, did have the popular vote. Yeah, but I'm talking about electoral votes. Yeah. I, th I think yeah. that ultimately we're going to find out that electoral votes, votes were changed. And, and mm -hmm. that, that truly was... Uh, well, I'll just, I'll just quote a, a former president uh, who has supervised many elections in third world countries, Jimmy Carter, mm -hmm. who said the other day that he's he an did. illegitimate president. He did. Um, but putting that aside, your, your point, I know, was more, you know, what, she was going to lose it. And... Um, I would have preferred clearly for Hillary to be president than Donald Trump. Mm. Um, in in a way that was kind of no one's fault, and it certainly wasn't her fault. And and I've had arguments with people about this all of the time, um, pe especially in these days. I I draw things that are very critical of Republicans, and I draw things that are very critical of, of Matt Bevin and Donald Trump. Mm -hmm. um, and so I think. It, it, in, a, in a lazy way of thinking, I think people can start to assume that that I think that everything that the Democrats have ever done is great, and mm -hmm. everything that they're going to do is great, and mm -hmm. et cetera. And that's not true at all. Some yeah. of the worst. Well, I mean, I just I just finished an essay about my hometown, about Ashland. Um, uh, that if you know, if, if I haven't made too many spelling errors and grammar errors, uh, the Courier is going to publish. And one of the points that I make there is that the. The suffering in eastern Kentucky is, is a two-party failure, and frankly, probably more a Democratic party failure, mm -hmm. uh, because there's only been two or three Republican governors, for right. goodness sake. Right. Hillary was uh, an awkward and unfortunate choice because the things that we would have most strongly criticized and tried to criticize Donald Trump about, besides his obvious in, uh, you know, incapacity for the office, um, his investments, his foundations, the a lot of the other things his 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 uh, sexual uh, offenses well every one of those things some fairly and many unfairly nonetheless could be uh, uh, touted by the Republicans as criticisms of Hillary mm -hmm. now there is an answer to all of those things first of all whatever bill did wasn't what Hillary did mm -hmm. um, you know as to the foundation well ultimately you can do an extensive um, CPA level um, uh, accounting analysis of the funds of the foundation and distinguish it from the Trump Foundation. But the fact is, that's not how campaigns work, and they're shorthand. And it undercut the things that she was tied to, the baggage of a life of career service, mm -hmm. which is really tragic. Mm -hmm. um, 
are the very things that uh, helped undercut her, yeah, so that exactly. the so that the race could be determined by eighty-five thousand mm -hmm. votes in Wisconsin, and um, I hope we don't run into that again. One way or the other, because there needs to be. You know, one of the things that um, always distinguished the United States in my mind was that we had peaceful and fair transitions of power, mm -hmm. transfers of power that everyone accepted. Then you fought about trickle-down economics, mm -hmm. and then you fought about whether we should be at war, and then you fought about all of these other things which you should fight about in the political spectrum. But um, ever since Bush v. Gore, when there were legitimate and remain legitimate I'm not a conspiracy theorist, but I'm also not blind to mm -hmm. things that happen. I mean, my, my legal training and the cases that I work on and knowing judges and knowing courts <clears throat> and lawyers. Um, ever since Bush v. Gore, there's been a question about whether or not our elections are safe. And that's third world stuff. I lived in third world countries. Mm -hmm. And um, I remember being terrified when I was down there because the lid is off yeah. and, and I, unfortunately I think the lid's still off yeah. um, regardless of your political persuasion him in office you know what I'm, I'm not a Trump I actually wasn't a Trump guy before him running his uh, doing this campaign and the election I just, just something I, I think, honestly it was his, I mean look at he he's disgusting to me his hair <laughs> everything about him is just freaking disgusting and then yeah, obviously, he's just very arrogant, but, you know, business, whatever. I used to spend a lot of time knocking him and the administration and all this. And then it just kind of hit me that, you know, let's just accept these four years. Hopefully, it's just four. If it's, if it's four more, I guess even if it's four more, whether it's four or eight, this is going to be a window of time when... To me, sadly, the U.S., for a, a lot of it, we're a very racist country. <laughs> and all these... Fucks. We elected a black president, well, Kevin. How could yeah, you say that? Well, when Trump came <laughs> in, these guys, these people came out of the woodwork. You know, the, here's the thing. Um, well, they well, me, started oh, to when Obama was there. Yeah. Anyway, go ahead. No, and you're right. They started to. But now it's like they've got the, the door opened up for them. So now all these people can be them, themselves. The other day I was having a conversation with a Trump supporter, and clearly I offended her when I said, every racist in, in the U.S. Vote, voted for Trump. And her reaction right away, I'm not a racist. I said, that's not what I said. No. I said, every racist voted for Trump. Not every racist not every Trump supporter is a racist. Every bourbon is whiskey. Every whiskey is not bourbon. There you go. Right. And uh, but yeah, it's uh, so from that perspective, when we years down the road, we'll look back at this time and we will be some of us will be like WTF. That was <laughs> who we that that's who we are at that that moment. Well, so let me add a a, a point of view that the lawyers talk about. Okay. In the end, for most of the history of the United States, regardless of what the legislative branch or the executive branch did, you had the courts. And the courts have always been full of politicians. Mm -hmm. You know, I mean, it's... No one, no one gets to the federal bench being an absolutely neutral, uninvolved person, but a great lawyer their entire life. Mm -hmm. Those people are invisible. You want them to be your lawyer, mm -hmm. and you want them ultimately, maybe, maybe you don't. Um, but So the federal bench, the appointed bench, not the elected bench, right. which is in Kentucky and a lot of the states, but the federal bench all the way up to the United States Supreme Court has always been full of politically I I inclined people. Mm -hmm. Um, but more often than not, the history of the court shows that 
Republican presidents have appointed people they thought were going to be reliably Republican and conservative, and they fooled them. Mm -hmm. Democratic presidents have appointed people they thought were liberals and or Democrats, and they fooled them. Mm -hmm. Because in the end, the position was, I think the uh, the bigness of the position and the Supreme Court and the history, and these are all incredibly bright people at that stage, um, they ultimately, over the course of centuries, got it right. They returned a slave or two to their owners um, and Dred Scott and things like that, but ultimately they tend to get things right and we move two steps forward, one step back mm -hmm. toward as they would say in church, toward righteousness, mm -hmm. right? Toward legal righteousness. Um, the lawyers know now that there are unqualified, dangerous men and women that are being appointed to the federal bench. This is Mitch McConnell's fault. And here's why that's a bigger problem than Donald Trump being president or even Mitch McConnell being still the majority leader. Mm -hmm. It's because 30 years from now, well, first of all, two years from now, I'll back up, four months from now, when the next really important matter comes before the United States Supreme Court, it's already a five to four majority. Which, which matter is this? Or just I could name three okay, of them. Right. Yeah, I could name right, three right, of them. Right, right. um, I mean, uh, among the matters that's going to make its way to the United States Supreme Court within the next couple of years and be decided, make its way to the Supreme Court soon and be decided within the next year and a half are all the... Um, Reproductive rights cases, all the abortion mm -hmm. cases. You know, it's not, it's not a um, coincidence that all of these bass ackward states, including Canada, Kentucky, and, uh, and, and Kentucky, you know, right. are, are, are signing into law facially, presently facially unconstitutional legislation restricting the rights of women, mm -hmm. which they never would have uh, tried before, and if tried, would have been struck down in the first district court they hit, the way the courts work, district court, appellate court, Supreme Court, okay. federally. Mm -hmm. um, but they know that they're going to make their way to the Supreme Court. And they know that we have a man who clearly shouldn't be sitting on the Supreme Court. Okay. Kavanaugh. Yeah. Okay. And then a man who probably shouldn't be sitting on the Supreme Court, Gorsuch, because it should be Merrick Garland. Mm -hmm. And the balance has shifted. Um, so in other words, the we've pulled the goalie. What's happened is, to use a sports analogy, because we talked about that before, it, the way I look at what used to be the final protector of the most basic constitutional principles that keep us moving forward, keep us safe, has been the United States Supreme Court. Mm -hmm. I believe the United States Supreme Court is compromised at this point, and I'm not alone in that, and I'm not, this isn't... Mm -hmm. No, Again, right. you know, no, uh, you're not. Roswell. Right, yeah. uh, I'm not bad, talking Matt. about aliens. Don't be bad about aliens. Although it, ends, aliens. No, although it <laughs> ends up, they were right about the UFOs. They were right. The Navy has them on film. But anyway, exactly. um, what's happened at the Supreme Court, though, Trump has pulled the goalie. Mm -hmm. And um, there's the only thing that I have friends who are serious constitutional scholars. They're real lawyers. And they... Their only hope is that um, all these bad bills, all this bad legislation, all the unconstitutional conduct that uh, the president himself is committing mm -hmm. and others in the administration, that maybe somehow the better angels, you know, hovering in the air around the Supreme Court are going to move the justices mm -hmm. to continue to preserve what we have. Mm -hmm. um, you know, one of the things that the framers of the Constitution knew that they couldn't legislate about, they couldn't write this into the Constitution. Um, it's the one thing that they had to just pray and hope on, is that there's no protection against an, a willfully criminal administration. There's, there's, there's the presumption within the constitutional formative documents that there will be an element of good faith, if not in the presidency, then in the legislature. Mm -hmm. If not in the president, then in the majority leader. And if not in them, then in the Supreme Court. Mm -hmm. And it, when that's gone, then this experiment is 
over. Mm-hmm. It's over. It's been a so on that <laughs> light note. <laughs> well, I'm gonna we'll stay 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 on that note. <laughs> Back to your cartoons. Um, has there been anything that you you put out there that um, threats or anything you've gotten some really nasty, borderline, harmful comments? Clearly, if you're going after Trump, you're going to get some of his people who will just come at you because you're, you know, you're you're challenging or mocking the chosen one. The chosen. <laughs> I like it. How in the hell has Christians and evangelicals got behind this guy? I mean, this guy has um, been the epitome of. Um, Sin, I mean debauchery. Right, <laughs> Kevin. That's five more podcasts. I don't. Well, you know what? Yeah, <laughs> I'm actually. I'm gonna. Go, I'm gonna throw this out here, Mark. You're gonna have, just like, I, I, I rip off Joe Rogan's format, but Joe Rogan is as a mentor, um, someone I look up to with podcasts. He has his select few that are recurring guests. You, you're gonna have a, a recurring ticket to come on because what I've come here where were we at 46 minutes we're going to go about an hour because i've got a you know segmented you've for got the night. actual are actually um, do, talented people coming you know, in i've got uh, my whole <laughs> night has been talented but clearly we could we can keep talking and i definitely you have a definitely have an invite to come on anytime well, and we you. can just shoot the shit and have fun with it that's not nice. but, but going back is there has there been moments when you've because the truth is, what you do is meant to get a reaction. To me, it is. Now, maybe to you, it's you're conveying a message. But that is, you're going to get a reaction. Especially right now, on how loyal they are to 45. Yeah. To the man in orange. He is orange. They will... You, know, you can... You say and, there, and And when you say they... Not everyone's the same, and there's uh, just as with uh, the other side, if you will. There's people it that is. react differently, but no, there's they're prone to violence. Yeah. There's there's a there's a predisposition among the most rabid of them, not all of them. There are Trump voters in my family. Yeah. There are Trump supporters in my family. Same, same. And people who I who I like and, and respect too. Uh, I've got a couple of rules, and one of them is. Um, I, I've used this phrase, and I didn't make up this phrase. Somebody gave it to me, but uh, with rare exceptions, I never punch down. Um, I, I knew at the time and understood at the time why people voted for Trump. I, I really haven't questioned that. I, I don't have an attitude. I don't have a. I'm not from the big city. I live here now. Mm-hmm. Of course, people in New York would laugh about the fact that I could just call this a big city, but <laughs> by God, it's a big city. Um, I've never had the attitude where I was um, uh, felt superior over people who uh, don't live in Louisville who voted for Donald Trump. Mm -hmm. I get it. And and as I've said many times, if the Democrats had done their jobs, you know, Mm -hmm. um, I made this point before, too. Of the presidents of the United States who have used the word poverty, literally the word poverty, and you know there's there's algorithms to do this math. Mm-hmm. Barack Obama said the word poverty fewer times than any other president. Really? Yeah. yeah. So it's it's not just it's just not that problem. Mm-hmm. So I don't punch down. Right. I will say I'm not going to punch him. Right. But at this point in time, if you're going to support Donald Trump, then you're willfully willfully ignorant of of history and of what should have been America's place you, you, it, could, we, you could have put a period after the, the ignorant, <laughs> but you <could>. of America's <laughs> place yeah, in the world nice nice <laughs> um, that being said that's a different issue mm. no, um, I and I, I'm not it's not me to judge voters and people that are struggling to get to work get to the grocery store and come back home mm-hmm. but I do punch up and I have to punch up. And the idea that 
and, and this is what distinguishes Matt Bevan and why I think I understand why people want term limits I understand why people why professional politicians if you will uh, developed a, a bad reputation but politics is a profession Abraham Lincoln was a professional politician mm-hmm. that's a good point yeah. no, John Kennedy was a professional politician right. um, Ronald Reagan to, to, to go to the Republican side um, was a professional communicator and yes he was an actor and yes he did commercials for Borax you probably don't remember what Borax no. is. It's a, is it, it was a bleach. It was a bleach substitute yeah. detergent. Yeah, yeah. That's your lesson, kiddies. Um, but he was also a governor of a state before he was president of the United States. And um, for Matt Bevin, as a governor of Kentucky, to specifically, in a tweet, and we talked about this before. Um, to use a, a social media, an, an important but often erratic and misused social media platform to call out by name a, a sitting judge in the circuit court of Franklin, Frankfort, Kentucky, mm-hmm. which you, you may not know, but uh, matters of a state of statewide importance are filed in Frankfurt. Gotcha. It isn't just like filing a lawsuit in Jefferson County or Boyd County or Greenup County. Um, and he called I mean, that, it's a state capital. It's a state yeah. capital and there's special jurisdiction. So the, yeah. the matters that you see, for instance, Andy Bashir filing lawsuits there against mm-hmm. the governor and everything else. For the, for the governor of the state, who, from my perspective, can be as Republican as he wants to mm-hmm. be. He can, he can be as conservative as he wants to be. He can believe that, in fact, people should have to work 80 hours a week to get dental care. He's wrong, mm-hmm. but he has the right to believe that. But then for him to take the system and to, as a leader, make the citizens of this commonwealth believe that it's okay to criticize a sitting Supreme Court judge, not or, or circuit court judge, not because, uh, uh, well, well, because he disagrees with a decision. Right. And to and this, is, this goes back to the judges that I was talking about. And you can tell I have a focus about the rule of law. But to diminish the respect for the rule of law. Because people come into court anyway not expecting to respect the rule of law. And that's the only reason we're here. America hasn't governed itself with guns, you know, for 250 years. It's been the rule of law. Mm-hmm. Um, and then for the governor to be so thin-skinned to call me out by name. He did, didn't he? You know, was it all over so a, cartoon? a cartoon? Yeah. First of all, it, to, it made me laugh. I was going to say you went to sleep with a smile. Oh, I went to sleep with a big smile. So, so first of all, Governor, I won. Yeah, you because, did. Because, as I said, you're the governor of the state. It's, it's like the movie. It's like one of the five best movies ever made, Rudy. Thank you. When the um, uh, coach, uh, when Coach Devine says to the captain of the team, "You're an All-American and a captain. Act like it." Remember when they tried to give him his jersey mm-hmm. so that Rudy could wear it? Well, that's what I say to Governor Bevin. You're, you're the governor of a state. Act like it. Mm-hmm. You know, what you do, if you don't like what a, an opinion writer says about you, is you either act differently or you laugh it off or you ask for a signed copy of it and you put it on your fucking wall. Mm-hmm. You, Finally. <laughs> Fifty-some minutes in, I got the F-bomb. Yeah. You don't, excuse me. No, you, you bring it. You don't... <laughs> incite others to attack him. You don't incite others to attack the rule of law, to attack judges. Mm -hmm. And and then back to your question. Three or four times a year, I I have to call security at my law office. You really do? Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. I'm never really afraid. I will say this. None of my friends walk to lunch with me anymore. If they do, they're walking like you know diagonally. Yeah, they're, you know, they're not walking a straight line. <laughs> a bunch of tough guys. You know, if I was them, I'd put on some shades and have a little hook coming out of my earpiece. Yeah, you know. like a secret service. Exactly. Yeah. No, we can't mess with um, secret service. Yeah. We still live in the only one of the only nations where editorialists, journalists, and um, political cartoonists. You, haven't, you realize haven't you, been jailed or haven't been attacked. Right. I don't know how long that's going to last when, when you have the president of the United States at campaign rallies that you're paying for with your tax dollars calling the people that he's looking at right in the camera the enemy of the people. Exactly. 
you're an enemy of the people. Right. Here's two enemies of the people. Yeah. Yeah. Cheers, my brother. Yeah. Um, yeah, just imagine your peers in these other countries, you know, their heads would be handed to their family. You know, it's how... I, I, had, I was invited to a dinner. There's a um, cartoonist named Zunar. He goes by the na- pen name Zunar, Z-U-N-A-R. You ought to look at his stuff. Okay. See, and um, I had, he he's in Malaysia, okay. yeah. and he has been imprisoned numerous times. Yeah. And the thing about being in prison in Malaysia, um, it's kind of like being imprisoned in you know in Rikers, meaning that there's no guarantee you're ever going to get out, or right. that anybody knows who you are. Mm-hmm. And fortunately, because he's a public figure, um, the the media and the cartoonists international. Uh, make it a point. Oh, they've just jailed. They've just jailed Zunar again. But you're right. But that doesn't always. I, I guess the, the the main point that that you think about in these regards is that the way it is now, or the way it was four years ago. It doesn't always have to be that way. And um, I'm not an alarmist. I am 60. I've seen a lot. I've, I've lived, just going back to the first thing, I've, I've lived in a third world country. I've, I've been in El Salvador when we were not at war with El Salvador, but people were dying. Uh, I've, I've lived in Europe during the Cold War. I was in the Fulda Gap. My unit had 23 minutes to live if the Russians came rolling through. You, had, you dealt with the Chernobyl cloud? I've, I've, I'm a survival of Chernobyl. <laughs> The point is that uh, these eyes have seen a lot. And it can change. And I'm very worried. And as I, to to restate, and I apologize, the the courts bother me. And the courts bother other lawyers. And... uh, you, that'd be a good guess. There, there are scholars, there are constitutional scholars. It might bore the heck out of your audience, but there are people who know a lot more than me about these courts and uh, the manner in which they have been degraded. Um, and it's, it's troubling. Um, is there right now a Democratic candidate that really has a shot at beating him? Well, let me start back. I don't think it's Biden. I'm not. It's not Joe Biden. I'm it's not, not Joe Biden. It's, it's not Joe Biden. Biden. It's not. Is God it? love him. Yeah. But the Democratic Party needs to get over the Lifetime Achievement Awards. Yeah, that's, a, and, that's a great way and, to put and, it. And to a certain extent, with all due respect, because I, something that would possibly be interesting to you is to go back and watch Hillary Clinton's, listen to a tape of Hillary Clinton's speech, her commencement speech. She was the valedictorian when she graduated from her private college where she was told not to say something and she said it anyway. Mm -hmm. And it's fabulous. And that's the Hillary Clinton that everybody sort of originally supported. Mm -hmm. Um, Now, uh, we, as as a party, I drew a cartoon one time, getting back to the, the cartoons. And the, my editor at the time with The Courier said it was his favorite cartoon I ever drew. It was The Island of Misfit Toys. Remember that from mm-hmm. um, yeah. uh, Rudolph the Red-Nosed yeah. Ranger? And on the Island of Misfit Toys was an elephant, like a polka dotted elephant, and a donkey with like six legs. Yeah. <laughs> but the point was the elephant was the Republican and the donkey. And the elephant said, I'm, I'm morally beleft, bereft, and uh, I'm uh, a, a greedy uh, uh, something something. Mm-hmm. That's what the, the elephant said. And the donkey said, I'm incapable of winning elections. And that kind of defines to me it at is. this point in time yeah. the Republicans and Democrats. Right. I mean, if, you had, if you're an adult leader, again, not punching down, if right. you're an adult leader... And, and you're holding office as a Republican, and you're not saying that this is not my Republican Party, then you're the enemy. And, and here's the thing you need to understand about me. I mean, I've spent my life um, in conflict, meaning that I'm a lawyer, I'm a trial lawyer. So I'm, I'm either fighting the prosecutor, I'm fighting the defense attorney. Uh, in, in politics, I, you know, I fight people. But up until recently, to me, these people have been opponents and not enemies. And when I get involved in a lawsuit or a, a criminal prosecution, and I'm treated like I'm the like I'm the enemy, 
then uh, I, it, it makes me it makes me very unhappy. That's the system works when people recognize each other as opponents, not enemies. But these people are enemies, and and I have enemies now, and I'm not afraid to say it um, because we're losing what used to be and what should be America. The President of the United States just said that he will no longer speak to the ambassador from England. Over that leak, that supposed leak, right? Is it what Whether the, or not it was a leak, oh yeah. whatever was said was true. He's inept yeah. Oh, I'm and the corrupt. Yeah. Uh, so you have, it's, a, it's, a, it's an awkward situation. You either admit you're inept or corrupt, or I guess you stop talking to the ambassador from England. But I think the last time we stopped talking to the ambassador from England was right before the tea party so it's um, you asked me who the, the candidate yeah. is so who it's is, not Joe Biden who is it? I, don't I don't think it's Bernie either I think I will say this Bernie Sanders has been saying the same thing since he was 18 years old he actually has and every single thing that the whoever the current front runner is among the Democrats is proposing and is saying and is saying full throated and in good faith and with a full heart are things that Bernie Sanders has been saying That's his true. entire life. And Bernie Sanders did not vote for war in Iraq. Mm-hmm. And Bernie Sanders did not vote for it. You know, you could fill in the blanks. Mm-hmm. He's always been there. So I don't know who it's going to be. Uh, I think that it should be Bernie. I would. I wouldn't mind it being Bernie. I just don't think it's. For some, I, the time for half measures is over. Yeah. The time for Allison Leonard and Grimes to deny that she voted for Barack Obama, who was then the president of the United States. I don't know how that is yeah. over. Yeah. Um, and I think America is ready for it if we give them the chance. So, Warren. Harris, you're good for that? Either. For those of you who can't see, I've just raised my yeah. glass of yeah. Old Forester to, to both of them. Both of them. Um, Are we ready for someone like Mayor Pete? Such an interesting guy. And I lived in South Bend. <laughs> yeah, that's right. Um, Notre Dame. <coughs> he raised almost as much money yes. as, as Joe I like Biden him. in the last I quarter. Like him. Smart, uh, veteran. Um, Look, the future of America isn't white, isn't a straight white man. No, it's not. And I, and I only say that. I'm not self-loathing. I'm a straight white man. <coughs> but I can read and I can look at maps. Mm-hmm. You know, the future of America is a woman. The future of America is black. The future of America is gay. The future mm-hmm. of America is Hispanic. The future of America is an immigrant. Mm-hmm. Uh, um, well, he's next generation, too. Yes. He's you know, so. Yeah, right. Oh, see that that makes me mad. Cause he's, I, I said you were. I was in the fourth grade when you were born, so I was he's probably dead. in college when he was born. He's so. thirty-seven. <laughs> he's thirty-seven. So yeah. Wow. Anyway, I'm old too. Compared to you know who I want my candidate to be. I want my candidate to be somebody who speaks the truth, who sets idealistic goals, mm-hmm. who does the 2019 equivalent of saying we're going to go to the moon in this decade, mm-hmm. and is willing to fight for that, right. and isn't. Uh, satisfied with with um, half measure. Right. It's too late. Anyway. I'm with you. All right. We're winding this down. Um, good stuff. I want to play along with me. This is what I call a round of shots. It's rapid fire. Mm. Okay. Car- painless. First concert you attended. First concert I attended? Yeah. Chicago. Cincinnati, Ohio. 1978. I'm a Chicago fan. Um, it was fifteen dollars. Seventy-eight. 15? Good oh, seats yeah. for fifteen dollars. Yeah, good. I should have said because I'm so old. I should have said Benny Goodman. <laughs> anyway, I'll let you go. Go ahead. Uh, superpower. What would it be? Time travel. Um, There's stop. a guy named Fred Trump. He used to live in New York. That's why time travel is my... Uh, anyway, I, I, yeah, I, I digress. That's, I, I, yeah, that's a, that's a, uh, I'm with you there. Um, stuck in an elevator with a celebrity, who would it be? Bruce Springsteen. Um, pet peeves. Yeah, well. 
Some do, long, somebody doing doo 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 in the background. No, no, no. I like that. <laughs> yeah. um, that's jo- that's Johnny Cash. John There's, Cash Johnny Cash. Yeah. That's Kid never going to be a pet peeve. You know what pet peeve? Um, long telephone conversations, in which you are telling me the same thing for the ninth time. You do still have telephone conversations, right? I have clients. Yeah, you have clients. <laughs> do, you, do you talk to your kids on by the phone or by text? Oh, for God's sake. <laughs> it's, uh, what kind of weirdos yeah. do you think exactly. my kids are? Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> it's a seven-line text. Know. Also, they're men. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. All right. Um, <laughs> if and This is, you mentioned time travel. Uh, if you could go back in time, uh, any period in time, where would you go? To observe, you're not going to change. You can't like go back and with a semi-automatic and mow down the Romans to save Jesus. You can't. No, it's yeah, no. <laughs> I thought about this a lot. Yeah. Um, no observing. I mean, just, just observing. Yeah. And despite all the conversation about the fact that you can't possibly be there without affecting change, I don't think that's true. I think if you're in the corner, why does that change anything? Fair. Fair. I want to know if they really sat on the same side of the table at the last supper at the last supper because that's truly weird. That they're all. It's <laughs> a good point. <laughs> I don't like that. No, one. I would time travel back to the time of Jesus. Yeah. I used to be Catholic. Okay. I'm no longer Catholic. All right. But um, Jesus existed, and I want to know what the hell happened. All, no pun intended. Yeah. There you go. These last three, I consider with I think a lot of people consider them to three of the most important questions in the world. Where's the bartender? Uh, We'll come back. I'm teasing. <laughs> um, the first two are yes or no, so just go yes or no. The last one, you can give a short answer. I'll play by the rules. Is there, uh, is there a God? Yes. Are we alone in the universe? No. What happens when we die? I don't know. I th- they're all the same to me. Well, I, I take it. <laughs> So, no, keep you know, talking, you, 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 that awkward feeling when you're you're being interviewed and your manager shows up. <laughs> your manager. Making sure you get paid. <laughs> <laughs> to check some Alan Cobb, ladies and gentlemen. What time to come? Need a lawyer? Hire Alan Cobb. Oh, gotcha. Hey, is Dustin coming tonight? She came to see her. No, she's in she's in Owensboro being a lawyer. Being a lawyer. <laughs> Somebody's working tonight, right? Exactly. You need anything? Right. You we are winding down. We are winding down. Uh, people uh, reach out to you on social media where would that be Facebook follow all of your work yeah so Facebook is um, it, 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 Facebook you get bonus content as they say because I write some and uh, that's just me just Mark Murphy um, there's also a business page Mark Murphy cartoons which you'll get basically the same thing and you won't have to deal with family photos <laughs> uh, Twitter is at Murphy Cartoons. Insta is Murphy Cartoons. Okay. There you go. Very good. Cool. Yeah. Mark, Thank you. I appreciate it. It was this is fun. Well you're you're gonna you're gonna get hit with uh, other invites because as long as this shit show is still happening in DC and should he lose and push to not would be removed from all that's that's a whole other topic that's still in play yeah so but thanks for having me appreciate it it's nice man thank you all right